Thank you for joining us at the University of Essex on our Space to Grow programme on investment readiness, aimed at bringing investors and entrepreneurs together to fund innovative projects. This is a series of webinars that we have been running uh, successfully over the last few months and will continue to do so. So please watch out for further announcements of forthcoming webinars. Today, we are entertaining live pitch events. These events are being recorded and will be available to anybody who requires a recording afterwards. Uh, so please watch out for our website on LinkedIn, on Twitter and Facebook uh, for further details, but you will be contacted. So thank you. I see we have got quite a, a significant number of people watching us today. So no pressure on these live pitches. Now, each of these live pitches has been brought to you from the Angels at Essex Equity Investment Platform. This is a regulated FCA compliant platform where registered investors can invest in opportunities which are innovative and disruptive moving forward. Today, we have a panel consisting of William Miller and Nitin Patel, who are eminent uh, innovators themselves. Dr. William Miller is a fellow of the University of Belfast, former innovation advisor for New Anglia, and also uh, an innovation expert from BT, and has been responsible for many, many new products and services being launched. Uh, Nitin Patel is a fellow of the Judge Business School from Cambridge, and has been working with innovation for all his working life, in mainly in the automotive and engineering industries. So we have here a wealth of experience on new products and new services to market. Uh, abling assisting me is Josh Clark, who is uh, himself an innovator and, uh, uh, and has been through this process himself in the past. So has lots of sympathy for the, pan the panelists as well as the ent entrepreneurs who are presenting today. Today, we are um, looking at finding suitable innovative businesses to invest in using funding from Research England, which the university has available. And successful winners from today's pitching event will go round to a further round of uh, investment pitching for that funding and possibly beyond. So we have today four businesses which are pitching for this funding. Uh, we have Flarebright, Indian, Limbotech and Upside, all from different sectors with totally different projects. There's no overlap at all. And each one will be presenting on their own to you as an audience. We have polls that we'll be asking the audience to actually respond to. So please don't be shy with your trigger finger. Please use your mouse or your tablet or whatever it is that you do to, a, to answer those polls. We do welcome uh, stuff coming through. And if you do have any questions you wish to ask, please use the Q&A that's available on the screen. Uh, we're not using the chat today. It's only the Q&A. That's the only one we're monitoring. So thank you. So enough from me, John Stenhouse. I'm now going to hand over to William and Nitin, who have a short presentation for you. Thank you. If I've got the technology right, Nitin's going to give us an overview of the what we think the contents of an investment pitch deck should be. Okay. So you, you can see the contents are probably quite general in terms of areas you guys have covered uh, with various people you've worked with in getting your pitch to the state that you will be ready to present today. I, I suppose the key to what we tend to do, which is slightly different, uh, and I can sort of say that partly because some of my coaching at Judge Business School is slightly an earlier stage than this and probably a little different on the basis of our backgrounds in terms of mine and Williams uh, on the basis that we've worked most of our life in industry uh, and sort of delivering products out uh, and some of them physical products as well. So one of the things we've always found that work well are guys who've been involved in their industry. So when they're actually talking about the problem, they know really well about it and can really communicate it really easy. 
Because one of the challenges you have is most of the solutions will be unique. So for you to be able to explain that is a big key to any investor. But coming from that background helps you a lot. Uh, the other key thing for early stage is also understanding the competition and the IP. Uh, because most investors will want to know how you protect your idea if it is unique in solving a problem. So th there's a couple of things there that you really do want to judge early stage. Uh, doesn't mean if you don't have any IP, you don't carry on, but you understand that then the, the plan for you should be about getting your solution to market quickly and first. So other people are behind you if there's an opportunity for lots of people to come up with a solution. The other key area that is quite important at this stage is also the sort of business model, because most of our investors, and I say ours because of the way the platform structured, is open to a, a, a variety of investors, much wider than a set of angels would do, who have sort of started in that place looking for very early stage startups. So we tend to sort of balance the potential against some real businesses if you're from that industry. Uh, and I use the sort of analogy with BT and, you know, if someone's looking at digital or wireless, that type of thing, would we be looking at investing money in you or would I buy BT shares with the volatility at the moment? Uh, and that's not a fair comparison, but it's sort of comparison you'll get done against when people are looking to give you money. So that's some of the challenges in developing your deck, even though it comes under this sort of 12 headed uh, one pager. William, do you want to add anything? Um, the, the comment that I would make is that for me, one, and, and it's a fairly obvious statement to make, but the key thing for me is getting the problem statement uh, written in such a way that people can understand what it is that you're trying to solve, what your product or your service is trying to address. So for um, many investors, you need to be able to couch the problem statement in a way that they can understand, understand that it is a real problem and it's something that they can relate to. And then your solution, again, an obvious statement, but is your solution going to be a commercially viable one? You know, can, can, is there a business there that can make money from solving that particular problem? So that's the, the, the real focus for me. And, that, and that's the foundation on which everything else is built. And then there are two other areas which you know, I like to look at. One is what the market opportunity is, because although you could have a, a problem and a solution to it, if you haven't got a good market opportunity, then it's unlikely that you will generate the revenue that you need in order to create a business. And sometimes it's very difficult to work out what the market opportunity actually is. People talk about, you know, a total addressable market can be so many millions or billions of, of dollars or pounds. And then you can work down from that to what the, the serviceable addressable market is and then what market you can obtain. And if you get a percentage of one dropping down to a percentage, to a percentage, you can still get a big number. But is that number realistic? So I, I, I come from an engineering background, so I like to work from the bottom up again to validate that. So I tend to look at how many customers are there of the type that you're trying to address, how many customers can you identify, and how many can you identify in the region that you're going to serve, and then do, work up how much are they going to spend, and can you then see that I can get this number of customers spending this amount of money, which generates that market opportunity for me and also generates the potential revenue that I can find. And once I've done that, then there's another piece of validation to do is if I can see that there's this much revenue available to me, can I then service it? Have logistically, have I got enough people who can sell uh, my product or service to the customers to meet that need? Uh, have I got the ability to deliver it? And you know, will this whole work? So, in term in terms of the pitch deck, you're telling a story about the problem and the solution to it, and then validating that you've got a sufficient market opportunity and sufficient uh, logistical capability to be able to address the market that you can see for you. So, those are the kinds of things that I, I like to look at, and does it all add up and make sense? Because 
you want to make your story be a coherent whole and it and needs to be consistent in itself because that's what the investor is going to see. The other thing that's important is, as well as investing in the product or the service and hence the business, the uh, investor usually wants to know about the team themselves, who is behind it and what's your experience and what, how are you going to take this business forward? What, what does each member of the team contribute? So those are my sort of key things that you know I look at and try to use to understand that everything is self-consistent and does make um, sense. So I would stop there. Unless Nitin, do you have anything more to add? Or? No, I think the key, as I said, hopefully you know the people who've been through the discussion for an hour we've put together. Uh, when we talk through your pitches, we'll hopefully see the difference. Those of you who haven't, uh, we'll hopefully get through uh, the next stage and we can have that conversation. But I'm hoping that, you know, even though the concept's the same, what we, the input we give you uh, is a little different uh, and that makes you more ready for investment, as the, as the uh, programme says. And I guess there's one final thing to say, as in all good chat shows, we have a we have a webinar already recorded, which is available on the Essex Startups uh, YouTube channel. So if you want to go into it in more depth, if you go on to that channel and look for the webinar that Nitin and I have put together, then you will we will we go through this slide in much more detail and consider each topic in turn. And with that, I'll hand back to Josh to take us forward. Thanks William, thanks Nitin. Um, so what we'll do, I'll hand over to John to introduce the first speaker. Thank you very much indeed Josh. Thank you William and Nitin. Uh, excellent presentation. Okay, so our first up today is uh, Chris Daniels from Flarebright. Flarebright is drone technology. So I will now let Daniels, Chris Daniels, explain exactly what that's all about. Hi there then, my name is Chris Daniels and I joined this exciting company Flarebright um, as its Chief Commercial Officer just over 18 months ago. Um, my background is a series of blue chip and high pedigree institutions and for the last eight years I've been working in aerospace focused um, scale ups and what I want to share with you today is really my excitement and why I'm so interested in taking on this very much sweat equity role what excites me about Flare Bright and about drones. Um, there are still problems holding the drone sector back. Um, all drones are controlled either by remote control or by GPS or a combination of both. But what if these fail? And there's a real life example here in this um, picture taken from a UK government air accident investigation board where a 13 kilogram drone was jammed by a simple device bought off Amazon for 30 pounds and crashed into the side of that house. It could easily have crashed into a school playground or um, done something more serious. The drones will not be allowed to be used in urban environments for air taxis, for drone delivery until this problem is solved. What to do when your GPS or your remote control fails. A military use is required as a standard. Every operation expects this to happen. Um, so what Flarebright has done is we have come up with what the industry is looking for. And true autonomous flight, i.e. flight that doesn't rely on GPS or remote control. And it relies solely on inertial navigation and very sophisticated flight control software. Um, so what we've basically done is stripped out all of the hard work that a user has to use and made something fully autonomous. So in this example, one press of a button and you've got an autonomous drone that can fly up, take images and boomerang itself back to you. So this has led to three main product sets. So First of all, the ground launched um, system that we talked about before, which takes about 30 seconds to capture whatever images you want in any weather and in any conditions. We've got a 226,000 pound MOD contract um, to develop this 
into a sort of military standard ruggedized unit. We've also just received a 227,000 Innovate UK future flight project um, to look at measuring winds in urban environments to make other drone use safer using this same snapshot technology. And to give you a sense, it's this size. Um, but it's important to remember it's the software in here. This hardware wrapper is really um, what delivers a really good software solution. The second product set we've got is air launch to airdrop precision drone delivery. So using the same software technology, we can drop anything from a larger aircraft, in this case, um, the Wind Racers drone that's been in um, the news a lot for doing NHS drone trial deliveries, but precision drop to remote communities, um, things like medicines, vaccines, testing kits, um, which we'll get to within a meter of where they need to get to. So helicopters can do that, but it costs a fortune. Parachutes aren't accurate enough. And um, this is sponsored by NHS in Scotland for the remote highlands and islands community. But our real value ultimately, and our real moonshot and unicorn project is to embed our software in any other drone. And we're looking at a 400,000 project with the Ministry of Defence to do exactly that. And the idea here would be any drone that would have GPS outage, that might be for criminal malfeasance, state on state activity, just technical failure, would then fly safely using our drone technology for however long it wants. And we can get our autonomy to last for around 25 minutes, which is a quantum leap bigger than anything else that's available on the market um, at all. So where, where did we develop this technology and why is it so hard? Well, our origins were in subsea autonomy. Our two founders have worked in this area for 30 years, they've done it before, um, and under the sea, GPS doesn't reach and there's limited means of um, communication. So they um, successfully ex exited in 2014 and really used that expertise to do what their real passion was, which is could they take this technology and put it in drones and put it in the air? So who are our team? Um, Kelvin and Conrad work together at Seabite, um, and they are the real sort of brains behind the operation. Um, Kelvin's the electronics guy, Conrad is the um, software guy. I came in to commercialize it and do things like this. Um, and I've had uh, quite a lot of experience in aerospace and defense. And then we've recently brought on board Dominic Keane um, as a non-exec chairman to the board to bring a bit of more of structure and independence and representation of the shareholders onto the board. Um, we've got plenty of customer traction. Um, we've got all these letters of support from the head of drones of the UK police, from the head of innovation and maritime and coast guard agency, even from, from the city of um, Amsterdam around a um, digital twin platform. And we've equally got from tier one aerospace company sort of equivalent um, support. Um, the market for drones is huge. You all know that. And we address at least a 200 million pound market just with Snapshot and well over a billion dollar market for all our products. Um, because we're software and because we're software focused, we're very much um, a, a kind of rapidly profitable company. And however much we skin this and whatever um, sensitivity we do this we're always coming out of pretty positive numbers and we've got a mix between sales and subscription model to get to these numbers so to wrap up the ask we've launched a 500,000 pound raise we've already raised 350 that 315,000 of it so we're looking for the last 185,000 EIS eligible um, Brickbox a VC firm specialized in autonomy and robotics put a 1.8 million pre-money valuation on us. Um, and that's what we're looking for today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Now, are there any questions for Chris, please? Uh, William, Nitin? Yeah. William, please go first. Okay, um, Chris, you didn't mention IP and IP strategy in the presentation. Is there a particular reason for that? Or? No, I just, I, I totally 
forgot in my um, spiel. So we, we have got a patent about the whole system. One of the reasons why we want to raise equity is we're, I mean, our patent law lawyer calls us an IP rich environment. We just haven't had the money to pay for a lot of the patents. And interestingly enough, even the, the patent that we do have, we've got our first sort of £10,000 payment in February. Um, and, you know, we're questioning how valid that is and actually whether our defensibility is the fact we're developing this thing more rapidly and cleverer than the market. So we, we do have patent, uh, a patent, but we could patent a lot more. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Chris, is there an application for the average market on this rather than military? Yeah, so um, all the Innovate UK um, grants are very much focused on what you call, you know, an average market, civilian market. Okay. Um, that, that isn't just kind of the, the, the sort of security, police, fire service, um, the, you know, the drone delivery is, is directly applicable to the problem of what Amazon, UPS, Etc. trying to solve, you okay. know, how do you safely get a drone so, in somebody's job? So the one thing I'd ask then in your problem solution is explaining what 25 minutes means in real world. Yeah. Because, you know, the guys you work with, the military probably obviously understand all of that and how critical it is, but not having sort of control for 25 minutes, what does it mean for a drone to be able to do in distance or, you know, getting that delivery done? Because I think that's something an investor would like to know if it's going to be applied in general. Yeah, and, and, and 25 minutes is way more than any normal sort of urban civilian drone would, would properly need. Exactly, but all I'm saying is I think you might want to just put that as a solution yeah, got that. to make sure it's explainable. Yeah. I think, I think that, that raises a question in my mind in the uh, confusing the military aspect with say the health aspect of delivering drugs to islands in the outer hebrides you might need more than 25 minutes for a drone to actually get to an island in the outer hebrides well the the, the, the idea between a, a drone in the outer hebrides is we're airdropped from a, another aircraft whether that's a drone or a larger aircraft and that one of the biggest costs of any aircraft is is ascent you know, it's, it's that getting to height. If you can get to height, it's a bit like doing a milk round or, you know, even a, a delivery van. You don't just have one item in each delivery van. Whereas at the moment in aerospace, effectively you do because you go, you land, you take off and you keep doing that process. So if you go around and just drop things all the time, but having a small item like this that can then, you know, have 20 of these, 30 of these on a single aircraft, that's a real game changer. And it's a game changer. One of, one of the problems with a lot of the solutions around drone delivery is economics. And this changes the economics of the whole argument. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay, so we need to take a poll. Tell me, what does the audience think um, regarding uh, Flarebright and drone technology? Please, would you like to take this poll? Okay, so this one's just for the audience. So um, yeah, as, as John said, if you're an investor, would you be interested in investing in their products? And if you're not an investor and you were thinking of giving away a few millions, would you consider this as a project that you would invest in? Brilliant. Um, thanks, everyone. So what we'll do is we'll share those um, at the end if, if we have time. So thanks a lot for that. And we'll move on to the next pitch. I'll hand back over to you, John. OK, Ed, thank you very much. And Dave, would you like to share your screen? Okay, it, just one moment before I do share my screen, I'd have a little show and tell for people. So my name is Ed Kapoviak, I'm CEO of Ingenian Medical. We're developing uh, a suite of medical devices to treat urological problems. And this is an example of our first device that we're bringing to the market uh, within the next year. The main thing about this is our patent pending valve, which you can see right here which is a small ball bearing that's magnetized and a little washer. And what you do is once the, uh, the thing is inserted, you bring a, a larger magnet and it opens the valve automatically. And when you remove the magnet, it closes the valve again. Uh, this is quite a game-changing uh, innovation in the world of uh, 
uh, catheters, urinary catheters. Uh, and frankly, that market has been around for thousands of years. The ancient Greeks were the first to use catheters, which were literally straws that were inserted uh, to relieve uh, conditions. There are two main conditions um, that are experienced by patients. One is uh, called retention, which means that someone cannot urinate. And the other is incontinence, which means that you cannot stop urinating. Um, incontinence is, is the one that's heard about more than on television nowadays, but both are large problems for people worldwide. Um, what our device is intended to do is to restore restore the dignity to the patient. And also it's a way of reducing the risk of infection because uh, urinary catheters are one of the major sources of hospital acquired infections and a significant contributor to mortality in uh, from hospital acquired infections. The market itself is very, very large, uh, over $2 billion and it's growing lar in large part because of the aging population. Um, very recently, just in the past couple of weeks, uh, Ingenian was awarded a uh, 99 uh, and a half thousand grant from Innovate UK, and that money is specifically to fund the CE marking of this new product, um, which, like I say, should be commercially available next year. We're currently raising 375,000 pounds in the form of convertible loan notes. Uh, and we're using that hopefully to also access the UK Future Fund. And that will allow us to uh, facilitate the raise of a larger amount of money to fully commercialize this product and develop the next product, which will be for uh, male uh, incontinence. Currently over 200 million people suffer from bladder control problems. It's a large global market, uh, both in terms of disposables and the indirect costs from UTIs, urinary tract infections. Uh, men and women are both uh, affected, uh, but because of the different anatomies, we'll be developing products for the female market later on. Um, so the current solutions are called fully catheters, intermittent catheters, external catheters, suprapubic and absorbent pads. All of them have pluses and minuses to them. Uh, here are some pictures of our device and how the device is actually implemented uh, in the patient. But uh, what is really different about our device is that most other catheters actually extend outside of the body. And that means that they create a channel by which bacteria can be traveling into the body. Whereas our product actually works in concert with the body's own uh, infection control mechanisms because it doesn't extend out the end of the urethra, the urethra itself kind of seals. And that's a big part of how and why people don't get infections there normally, but uh, other types of larger catheters do uh, allow that to happen pretty easily. Um, the IP around our valve is what's different for us. And we can apply that and configure it in a wide range of different urological conditions. Uh, a quick snapshot of how we compare against other co uh, competitors in the market. We actually uh, don't require any external bags. Uh, we can be used for both retention and incontinence. Um, the frequency with which our device goes into patients is on a monthly basis, which means it's much more convenient. And again, will restore dignity to the patient because it will allow them to go to the, go to the loo in a more normal manner. So in terms, of, like I say, there's both the acute, which means a, a, a one-off uh, emergency type situation versus the chronic, which is a re regular and recurring base uh, problem that needs to be uh, addressed. And we're focusing more on the chronic market because that is where um, regular revenue is being generated. And then there's the retention versus the incontinence elements of the market. And we're looking to participate in both of those. Uh, this is a quick snapshot of where we see our product development pathway going along and where we think we're going to be able to affect both the male market and the female market over the coming years. In terms of benefit, benefits we're going to be bringing, we see an improvement in the quality of life by eliminating the need for other catheters, restoring a natural manner of filling and emptying the bladder, 
uh, and most importantly, reducing the likelihood in the incidence of urinary tract infections. And when we've done a, uh, an initial costing benefit of our te technology relative to existing technologies, particularly when it comes to the cost of urinary tract infections and the treatment of those, we are very substantially uh, advantageous. And we've got some good interest locally from some uh, urological surgeons that we're looking to work with now, as well as SNEF has uh, written us a letter of support for our technology. Uh, the board is very strong. Uh, we have a lot of experience from both our chairman and some of our NEDs who have experience uh, uh, on the main board of Boots. Uh, and our, uh, some of our investors are also represented on the board as well. Aside from myself, we have a very experienced CFO in the world of medical devices and two external advisors. Uh, Ronnie Bracken uh, actually worked at CR Bard in their medical division as VP for uh, their urinary products. And in terms of what we're raising, we're looking to raise right now 375,000 pounds in convertible loan notes. And this will position us very strongly to, like I say, not only get the CE marking and uh, begin to put this new device into patients next year, but also position us well to raise that next bit of funding that from venture capitalists or uh, corporate strategics who we're starting to talk to now. Thank you very much indeed, Ed, right on time. Um, very pleased about that. So I'm going to um, open up some questions first from William and Nitin. If you've got any questions, please step forward. One thing is just a point, you've got dollars and pounds mixed up. You might want to just look at that because trying to associate the two. The other thing is this field is quite cluttered in a sense because it's an old technology that's been used around for a long time uh, and I think the problem you're seeing is quite a key to it because every time someone gets ill it costs us eight times as much to get him right as the initial cost of implementing this but how have you got away without it being a medical device because it's going to go into someone so Great question, Nitin. And here's the thing. It is a medical device, but uh, the world of medical devices and the regulation of medical devices is different. There are different tiers. Anything from a tongue depressor or a, uh, an external Band-Aid are all medical devices, but they're known as class one devices. At the other extreme, class three devices are things like uh, coronary stents that get put into the body or a, an implantable pacemaker. Uh, those need to have extensive in-man clinical trials before they can be approved because our device goes into what is known as a natural orifice of the body and can be removed as well quite easily. Uh, it is a class 2A device. So it's not a class 1, but it doesn't require the same level of uh, ex extensive testing before we can get that CE marking and allow us to put it into the market with uh, knowledgeable uh, urologists who will recommend this to their patients and put it in that way. And again, it goes in for a temporary basis. And just one point on that. Could your competitors actually make a point of disagreeing with that? Because that's the key to whether you're cost effective or not. Um, uh, fair question. Uh, but again, other uh, urinary catheters are also themselves class 2A devices. So that is what we are. Okay. Um, and they can't copy us because we have a patent pending on this uh, valve design. No, that's what I understand. That's why I'd said they made the regulation harder. They can't yeah, yeah. copy you, can make it harder to say that doesn't play with the same rules. Mm -hmm. But anyway, just something to think about because I think that's sure. your big, big uh, selling point. The, the ease of fitting and the fact that it isn't a medical device, so you don't have the testing. Oh, oh, no, again, just to be clear, it is a medical device, but because it's the class 2A device, the class 2B device, again, would need more testing. Uh, we are not staying in the body for longer than 30 days. And that, again, keeps us at that lower end of, uh, of the regulatory thresholds. Uh, just to, on, I think the very last bullet point on the last slide, you said that you would consider a trade sale in a couple of years time, two, three years time. 
but in my sort of reckoning in two to three years time you would have only got going given the the length of time that it takes to get these devices in place and i kind of wonder you you the market must be huge hence the opportunity is huge and why would you want to sell out in my mind so early that's that's really so, what i'm asking very very good question and there is it, it's a healthy tension in my view between uh, making this company successful and getting our shareholders loads of money and helping people. And uh, as, a, as a business, at our current uh, projections, we think that if we have less than 2,000 patients using our products on a recurring basis, we will be a profitable business. However, there are millions of people in the world who really should benefit from this technology. And by selling the company or partnering perhaps with a large medical device dis distribution uh, company, we will be able to get that reach out more quickly. And that's where a trade sale would make sense for, because the, the, the uh, distribution channels that a company like CR Bar, that's now part of Beck and Dickinson have and could push this thing out really quickly. And again, their ability in terms of scales of manufacture to reduce the cost of making this even further would also help to bring this to the market more quickly. Now, you, that Thank said, you. we would we would still look for, for a healthy return for our investors. Okay, sorry to interrupt you there, Ed, but we are running out of time now. So thank you very much. Um, there are some more questions from the Q&A, but we will save those to the very end if we have that time. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, for that presentation. Josh, would you like to do the poll, please? Yeah, so same again, everyone. So if you were an investor, would you be interested in investing in this business? I think that's okay, so it. We'll leave it there. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'll hand back Thank you very time. much indeed. So sorry to rush you along, but uh, that was uh, quite a long Q&A there. So uh, I would now like to introduce David Norton from LimboTech. Uh, LimboTech is all about visuals uh, so let's see what you can do, David. So please share your screen. Good, fantastic. Okay, hello, uh, I'm Dave Norton. I am the director of Limbo Tech. We are a creative technology company. It's our mission statement to entertain, educate and inspire through the power of digital technology. We've operated for over 10 years uh, and worked across a vast array of different disciplines, creating lasting partnerships with a number of high profile companies and organizations. So why are we here today? Well, over the last two years, we've been in research and development for a brand new method of motion capture. Now you're gonna be hearing that word a lot over the next few minutes, so let's just explain what that is. So motion capture is the process of recording the movements of an actor and then applying it to a virtual character. And it's used primarily in film and video games. Traditionally, motion capture is very expensive and complex. Uh, it requires a warehouse sized studio, an entire team of specialists and technicians. And currently creative industries are paying anywhere from three to 10,000 pounds per day to hire a motion capture studio. This is excluding a huge number of companies wishing to use the technology in projects or productions, but are put off by the high price tag. This is what our brand new system can do. We use a completely new tracking method and off the shelf consumer components to build a system that provides outstanding results without the large upfront investment of traditional motion capture studios. Our system can fit inside a suitcase and it can be unpacked and calibrated within an hour. Due to our custom built software, as the actor's movements are being recorded, the fully rendered results can be viewed in a video game, VR headset or on an online stream in real time as it's happening, leading to some very exciting applications. If all this wasn't enough, we are able to charge as little as 500 pounds per day including preparation, editing, and actor hire. This is a fraction of the price of any other system. At the same time, our cutting edge tailor-made tracking technology provides the same level of quality as companies have come to expect. We're gonna show you a brief example of our system in practice. Sit play here. So you'll see on the left-hand side is the actor's movements and the main screen is the finished results, all captured in real time.
Former boggies, former bunts, and farmer bean. One short, one fat, one lean. These horrible crooks, so different in looks, but nonetheless equally mean. Here we go. We expect our motion capture system to seriously disrupt the video game and independent film industries, offering a huge advantage over the current offerings. There are currently over 2000 active video game companies working in the UK, which offers us a very, very lucrative market. And we also envision a number of other industries who previously wouldn't have had the budget will begin to adopt its use in their future projects, productions and campaigns is a brief industry case study uh, back, uh, made back in 2016. So the Royal Shakespeare Company partnered with Intel to use motion capture technology in a production of The Tempest, as well as receiving glowing reviews for its ambition, ambition and visual fidelity. The company surveyed those who were coming to see the show and they found that 12,000 attendees were aged 16 to 44. Over 8,000 of those attending had never been to a Royal Shakespeare Company production over 2,000 had never been to a theatre before, and they received over 9,000 tweets from 4,000 different contributors. This was, without a doubt, bringing in a new, hard-to-reach young audience into the theatre and developing a lifelong love of theatre and live performance. So how do we get there? How do we become industry leaders in the latest generation of motion capture and pathfinders of exciting artistic innovations? We're looking for an investment of 70,000 for 22% equity. With this money, we intend to build a small team of specialists to lead us through the first year of trading with an emphasis on engaging clients, networking with relevant industries and seeking partnerships and funding opportunities. We intend to begin offering motion capture services to video game developers uh, as early as January next year. And over that time, we'll build up a client base invest in improvements to the hardware and software. And by the end of the year, we hope to double up and invest in a second motion capture team to increase our potential output and reach. At the same time, we'll be approaching arts venues, theatres and galleries for partnerships or collaboration opportunities to understand how our technology can augment, the creative, uh, augment creative projects and help bring in new audiences for arts organisations. What makes us the best option? We have extensive experience of understanding and implementing the blend between art and technology. We have access to a vast network of engineers and artists that we've built up over the years. We're a small and agile company. We find it easy to pivot and adapt to changing markets, setbacks, and provide a personal touch for our clients. Limbo Tech has an outstanding track record of ambitious ideas in delivering excellence. Let's have a quick look at our growth potential and our current competitors. We've identified 300 uh, video game companies within our accessible market who we believe would benefit most from our product. There are currently only 10 motion capture studios in the UK and the cheapest competitor is over three times more expensive than what we can offer. Uh, in terms of theatres and arts organisations, there's over 200 national portfolio arts organisations whose KPIs, KPIs are focused on working with technology and attracting new audiences. We're already in discussion with three organizations looking to integrate our mocap technology into their projects. There are over 1000 immersive experience companies in the UK, which generate over 660 million pounds in sales. And we believe a number of these companies would benefit hugely from adopting our capture system to provide awe inspiring experiences for their audiences. We've mentioned a few there, but we're sure there are countless other applications for our system. A proportion of the investment we're looking for today will go towards research and development to define these applications and design intellectual property, which will offer bespoke solutions to the needs of these industries. Thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much indeed, Dave. Um, I'm going to open the question straight away to William and Knitting, uh, who would like to go first. I'll go first. Um, Dave, I'm intrigued by what you're doing, but I'm also intrigued by you yourself as the entrepreneur. I mean, what, could you give us a bit about your background? Because it says you're a theatre director, but there's a lot of technology in there. It's not something that comes up too often in that combination. 
Yes. Um, so I, I trained initially as an actor and worked as part of my early career uh, in theatre, directing and practitioning. Um, but I've always had as a hobby an interest in computers and coding and video games, obviously. Um, and that sort of hobby over the years has developed from being a hobby uh, into I was delivering some um, sort of tuition sessions based around technology. And it's just grown over the years. And now when people approach me, they're looking for someone who works in art and technology rather than either or either and or. Yeah. Yeah. Mitten, have you got any questions? David, it, it seems like you've talked about it as a service business, mm -hmm. but there's potentially some uh, technology that you've developed as well, using stuff that's around, but the software that you've put together. So is there a thought that, you know, you can develop that a little bit more as the business gets going? Because I suppose there could be companies who say, give me the package because they have lots of use for it rather than hire you. So you mm. might want to just think about that. But I, I agree with mm. you in terms of thinking about it in stages. Yes. Yeah. That, that would be a fantastic sort of five, 10 years that we could we could have that offer. Um, definitely. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much. Josh, would you like to run the poll, please? Indeed. So again, so um, if you're an investor, would you be interested in investing in Limbo Tech? Don't be shy. OK, so we'll leave it there. So thanks, everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Josh. So um, the last presentation today, the last pitch, is from Andres Smith with Upside. Now, Upside is a fintech business. As I said, everything today is something different. Andres, would you like to uh, share your screen, please, and unmute? Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Upside. My name is Andres. I am the CEO and founder. And our mission is to help people find money. The first service that we have launched is by reinventing cash back to get people money straight into their savings accounts. One of the issues we have nowadays is everybody talks about loyalty, but it's high friction and very low adoption. Nobody likes having a wallet full of cards, mini coupons, codes, browser extensions that intervene uh, and monitor and spy on you at every single thing surely there is a better way to optimize it. So what happens is that anywhere between 10 and 20%, depending on the schemes, people actually participate and they lose out on hundreds of pounds a year because of that. Now, enter in open banking. Imagine a world where you could just plug in your bank account for a trusted service to automatically look where you've spent at qualifying partners and moving the money frictionlessly straight into your savings account. Welcome to Upside. That is exactly what we do. We have an iOS app in test flight today. We have over 250 beta users who are um, gaining Upside every single day when they spend at brands like Costa, Amazon, Deliveroo, and so, and so forth. Here you can see some of the traction. I founded the company in, in January. We brought the team together in March and got some early money. Um, we launched into the market five months later in July. We've already organically built a waiting list of 1,200 people. Um, like I mentioned, we already let the first 250 in as we're testing and learning. And we're seeing a significantly positive conversion rate in that people tend to like the idea of automatically getting money into their savings account. At the other end of the scale, because the next question would be, that's great, but why would merchants do this? Why would retailers give frictionless cash back? What open banking allows um, retailers to do is to be much more scientific about which customers they attract as new customers, but also which customers they reward as loyal existing customers. Because we can use open banking, we can categorically say to retailers when they are approaching new customers, when they are approaching gonaways, when they're approaching customers that ad hoc shop with them, but mostly at some of their competitors. And this is tested very compelling. We've already, we've got a pretty strong uh, background, um, uh, business development team. My co-founder, Catherine, comes from the loyalty space. I had a previous business in loyalty, as well as a career in financial services. Uh, alongside one of our cornerstone investors, a guy called Brian Dunn, who brought gift cards to the UK, we've managed to already unlock 73 plus conversations with national brands. Today in the UK, there are six and a half million people who are what we would call frequent 
users of cashback um, and and the amounts that they generate is uh, in the realms of 5.1 billion a year we believe that because of today's friction the fact that you have to get a code or click a link or use an affiliate scheme means that the adoption rates are much lower our strategy is we want to embed this notion of frictionless cashback inside every bank or fintech app that is available in the UK and therefore get access to 27 million plus retail banking customers and therefore growing the whole market as a whole as well. By doing that, it means that all these that you can see on the screen are not competitors and actually they are our potential partners. Instead of fighting with a, a bank's reward scheme, why not join them, give them a, a way to not have their rewards and perks as a loss leader and incur costs, but in fact, give their own users of their banking apps something that's really interesting, really sticky uh, and differentiating functionality. This is what that would look like. And we are already in active conversations with 21 potential distributors, including the five big banks, um, as you can see illustrated here. No need to download an additional app or an additional piece of friction. We want to reach customers where they already are inside their existing banking apps. As I mentioned, quite a few conversations already on the going, everywhere from the small, bank, uh, uh, small neo challenger banks all the way through to the larger banks um, as shown here. Our model is to take commission on upside. It, we feel very strongly to be aligned with our customer, the end user. We only make money if we find you money. And therefore, as the cashback comes in, we take our commission and we pass the rest frictionlessly straight through to you. What that means is by using the Office of National Statistics data around salaries and around the spend data that we've already observed, we've modeled that we believe we can find an individual more than 327 pounds a year um, by 2024. And following the commission model, that is worth 50 pounds of annual revenue for us. We're a strong team that comes from this uh, two sides of this uh, industry, both financial services and uh, as well as um, loyalty. So as I mentioned, Catherine grew the discount vouchers business. Um, there's now 1.2 million marketing permissions in there, 400,000 of them are active each month. Myself and Paul come from um, uh, financial services. Uh, we've worked there for many years together. Um, Paul and Catherine go back a, a long time and Steve and I have a common friend Steve is our get stuff done, including part of the success of us launching in five months, including our FCA regulations within three months, is down to the fact that we've been previously regulated uh, and understand this market. We're also backed up by a, a very strong team of advisors. Paul Clark, who was the ex-CTO at uh, Tandem Bank, has helped us avoid a lot of complications in open banking. Marcus from Google um, has saved us years worth of development, including Renella and James helping us understand savings. Brian getting us access to those large retailers. As I mentioned, he brought gift cards to the UK. So for instance, we got into, you know, the first conversation we had with Sainsbury's was directly with the head of partnerships because he's got direct relationships as an example. Uh, and then Greg is helping us think through big data um, as the founder of Oxford Risk. Our projections, this is a classic marketplace projections. So we benefit or fail by the fact that it's a multiple between the number of customers and the number of retailers. So what you'll see here is that we'll have a huge acceleration in revenue and a huge drop in unit costs as the business scales. Um, therefore, the margins will be negative in the first few years, but as we reach that scale, it becomes progressively profitable. We're looking for half a million pounds. We are EIS Advanced Assured. We've already raised 350,000, including from the likes of Ground Floor Ventures, which is uh, founded by Juliette Soliman, who's an ex-Octopus venture partner. Um, and we are looking for the additional 150. Just conscious of time to, to wrap us up. Uh, tremendous progress we've had in, in, in the last nine months. The money that we're looking for will help us accelerate now to our seed round in Q2 next year. Um, we've got very compelling use cases around the customers. We've signed our first partners, so we've proved that people will pay for it, um, as well as we believe there is significant growth opportunity. 
So with that, I will stop there and ask for questions, please. Thank you, Andres. Uh, yes, uh, we are running out of time. As uh, uh, down to my fault, my apologies, everybody. Uh, so, William Nitin, any questions yeah. for this fintech you, business? Do you need uh, FCA approval for this or not? So, so Nitin, there are two reasons. The first one is we are an open banking provider. So open banking currently is under the FCA licenses on AISP and PISP. So yes, we are regulated under that. Okay. And the second question, I suppose, is having got into people's accounts, how do you keep them safe? The good news is, so Paul, our CTO, um, used to be the chief architect of Aviva. So we understand regulated tech, we understand data security, we understand treating customers' data like it's your own, which it is. Um, so we've built right from the start encryption, privacy controls, uh, et cetera, is built right into the um, technology, number one. Number two, th that is the exact reason why the FCA regulates open banking is to have a level of diligence and compliance across that. Okay. Thank you. I have a question about the long-term future of cashback, Andres. If, if you make it easy for everybody to get cashback from the retailers, well, that's taking money away from the retailer. So does the retailer not have to raise their prices in order to compensate for that? And consequently, everything gets more expensive as you become more, more successful. The, the irony is it's actually the opposite. Today's mechanisms through affiliate marketing or cart linking, William, does actually is, is value destructive because it's broadcast mechanisms. If, if they offer a cashback deal through Amex or through Barclays Blue or for NatRisk Rewards, they have no mechanism to personalize or focus or target that deal. It just goes to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And you can argue that the customer would have come. The difference is but with open banking, we are we able to exactly allow the retailer to specifically target where they believe there can be incremental revenue and incremental win. Um, so they, they're actually more positive um, to help them solve that problem. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Andres. So, uh, Josh, would you like to run that poll, please? And please uh, press your buttons. So, again, um, if you're an investor, would you be interested in investing in upside savings? I think we're about there, Josh. Yeah, I think we're there. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. First of all, I'd like to thank my panel, William and uh, Nitin, for their presentations today and for the questions. Josh, for helping out and sorting out my technical inabilities. Uh, thank you very much indeed. There were two questions from the Q&A, and I think we've just about got enough time for those. Um, this is aimed at Ed. Um, is the magnet to move the ball bearing external? And if so, what if it gets lost? Uh, excellent question. So uh, every patient will be issued with two of these in case one got lost. And the other factor is that base, although it, there's nothing magical about these magnets, it just needs to be a strong magnet. So if you had another magnet, you know, somewhere uh, that you could find that was, was strong enough, uh, that would do the trick. Ultimately, again, we have lots of ways that we're looking at advancing our technology. One day we will hopefully have, uh, you know, it Bluetooth enabled where all you'll have to do is sort of click something on your phone, reverse the polarity between the two pieces of metal and it'll open the valve. That's, that's the theory, but those are other developments that we'll be doing some years from now. Thank you very much, Ed. Okay. So, um, I think that uh, brings our webinar to a close today. Uh, it goes to say thank you to all the pitches. I, I, as I said at the beginning, each of you is so different. It's, it's, it's refreshing to know that all this innovation is actually available to us in Essex. So thank you very much indeed for presenting today. I wish you all the very best for the future. We wish we will be in touch, so don't worry. And to my audience, thank you once again for attending. And please watch out for the videos that will be released afterwards and watch out for further uh, events that we are running. So thank you once again and goodbye.